mystery case that we have covered since the very beginning. Of course, she disappeared in October of 2015. And remember, this investigation is ongoing. If you have any information, we also have contact information for the Little Rock Police. Join me as I chronicle the life and the disappearance of Ebby Stepick, as well as hunt for the person or people who are responsible. I'm your host, Astrid, and this is Subterfuge in Shalomont Park, The Vanishing of Ebby Stepick. If you visit Shalomont Park in Little Rock, Arkansas today, it looks like your average playground and parking lot. However, there's an energy in the air, not making itself obvious at first, instead subtly brushing against your mind, like a cat weaving in between your legs. If you begin to walk towards the playground, you'll find your first clue as to the source of that ominous feeling. In front of a young tree is a noticeable plaque, which reads, In loving memory of Ebby Jane Stepick. She loved fiercely. Your curiosity and sympathy most likely piqued. A quick Google search provides countless articles and websites discussing the case of an 18-year-old girl who went missing in 2015 from Little Rock, Arkansas. Her remains were later found in the same area that her car had been found in three years earlier in Chalamont Park. Her case today still remains unsolved. My goal with this podcast is to tell Ebby's story and to honor her memory. Ebby is more than this captivating horror story. She was a person who was loved, who left so many friends and family members behind, and who tragically lost her life far too early. She was supposed to go out into the world and experience things. She was supposed to travel, she was supposed to graduate high school, she was supposed to fall in love, and she was supposed to grow old with her siblings. Perhaps maybe foolishly, my other objective with this podcast is to set out to solve this case. That might be impossible, but I won't know that until I try. With the recent growth of average people writing true crime books and making true crime podcasts that end up helping solve cold cases, I finally gathered the confidence to at least make an attempt at this. And even if I'm not the one who cracks the case, there might be someone out there who decides to listen to this podcast all the way through, and then solves the mystery themselves. I'm more than okay with that. Her memory and loved ones just deserve an explanation. What I desire more than anything else is to erase that giant question mark, that whisper that never leaves the back of my head. What happened to Ebby Stepik? A question that I get asked pretty frequently is why I'm interested in true crime. The answer to that is complex, but to briefly explain, I suppose it gives me a sense of security. The more I expose myself to the horrors of humanity, the less shocked I'll be if something like that happens to me. Perhaps I might be better prepared. Another common question that stems from the first one is specifically why I'm interested in Ebby's case. There are also a lot of different answers to that question. To start, the same year that Ebby was assaulted and then went missing, I was also assaulted. I felt a lot of overwhelming sadness that she had been hurt like that. Additionally, I consider Little Rock my hometown as I spent a lot of my childhood there. My mother had also grown up there and she had gone to high school and been good friends with Ebby's father. So not only did her disappearance and murder occur in what felt like my backyard, she seemed a lot closer than other missing people did. Ebby also wasn't that much older than me and seemed to do the typical things that teenagers do, which meant my mother's constant worrying texts were valid. It could happen to anyone. And finally, while I didn't know Ebby during the later years of her life, I did know her as a child. Like a lot of kids, Ebby and I both had braces. The first time I met her was at the orthodontist office, and I remember thinking that she was really pretty and that I liked the skirt she was wearing. I don't exactly remember who spoke first, I just remember that we started talking to each other as we both sat in a chair and waited for one of the hygienists to come and adjust our braces. We both got finished around the same time, and when we walked out into the lobby, my mother and her father were talking to each other. They explained how it had been a while since they'd seen each other, but they used to be close friends. It's a small world, especially in Arkansas. That happened several times, as we both had braces for a while. Eventually, she got her braces off, and then I was cleared to have mine removed. We both faded from each other's memories, other experiences taking their place. That is, until mine was revived when I heard her name and saw pictures of her on the internet, 
one of which was an old photo of her in her school uniform with that plaid skirt I had complimented. Her hair was up in a ponytail, and she was smiling, exposing her bright smile. I couldn't take in what my eyes were clearly seeing. Ebby was missing? Since when? Before I start the deep dive into who Ebby was as a person um, and start going over certain clues and aspects in the case, as well as theories, I think it's important to first establish the timeline um, of her disappearance from start to finish. And that means that we have to go all the way back to the summer of 2015. In the summer of 2015, Ebby began to change. She had interviewed and accepted a job at one of the malls in Little Rock in a Foot Locker store. She'd been meeting new people through that job and started dating somebody new. Her parents weren't familiar with this boy and were anxious. When school started in August, she chose to transfer schools and go to public school for the first time at Little Rock's historic Central High School. And a little bit of background um, about that high school if you're not familiar with the reason why it's historic. Little Rock Central High School was the center of the Little Rock integration crisis of the late 1950s. After the 1954 Supreme Court ruling ordering the integration of all public schools, nine black students were denied entrance to Little Rock Central High School. They came to be known as the Little Rock Nine. Do you have a great idea for a podcast? If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to get started. Let me explain. To start, it's free. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Additionally, there are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will also distribute your podcast for you so that it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and other listening platforms. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. And finally, it's everything you need to make a podcast, all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. And it's a little unclear um, why Ebby all of a sudden switched from, you know, private school her whole entire life pretty much um, to going to public school. To this day, um, I don't think her parents or friends really even have a definitive answer to that. Once she started attending the school and the school year was in full swing, she developed a habit of skipping class. Her parents attempted to have conversations with her about this, but Ebby had entered that phase of adolescence where she was rebellious and craved independence. Eventually, her mother gave her two options. She could work on her attitude and the problems they were having until everyone reached a compromise, or she could move out. Ebby chose to move out and primarily lived with her maternal grandparents as well as spending the night at various friends' houses. It was at one of these friends' houses that the fateful night of October 23rd 2015 happened, and horror ensued. Earlier that day, Abby had told her friend Danielle that she was going to a party later that night. When she asked Danielle if she wanted to come along, Danielle declined. Danielle later stated that she wasn't familiar with the people who would be at this party, and that they were more of Abby's friends, so she didn't feel very comfortable going. The following day, Abby contacted her stepfather, Michael. She conveyed to him that she wanted him to go with her to the Little Rock police station. She wanted to report that she had been raped the previous night at the party she attended, and that the perpetrator had filmed it. She also stated that she had called the Little Rock Police Department, but it wasn't ever publicly clarified how long the call lasted or why the call ended. In fact, to this day, the Little Rock Police Department still claims that they have no record of these calls. Her stepfather agreed to meet up with her to report this incident and also agreed to not immediately tell her mother, and instead wait. She spent part of the day watching Spongebob at her grandparents' house, which was a show she was a fan of, and ate dinner with them. She had previously scheduled to meet up with Michael after dinner. However, this is when it seems she vanished into thin air. Over the years um, following this disappearance, I've seen a lot of people kind of speculate why Ebby would choose to go to her stepfather Michael instead of her mother Lori, And I think it's kind of important to take in context, um, like, the time and what was happening. Ebby and her mother, Lori, were kind of having issues, typical issues, between, like, a teenager and parent relationship. And also, it sounded like Ebby, when she called the police department earlier prior to contacting Michael, the police there had been unhelpful. 
So my thought is perhaps she wanted um, some sort of intimidating presence to come with her, which would have been her stepfather, Michael. Her line of thinking perhaps could have been that she wanted an intimidating figure with her. She wanted some sort of backup to help her convince the police that she should be listened to. And I think when you put it like into that frame of reference, um, it's not so much like a, a detail that stands out anymore. Around the time that Evie had texted her stepfather about going to talk to the police, she had also been texting a friend named Gage, talking about the incident. She stated in text messages to Gage that she had felt forced into the sexual encounter that took place at the party and that she had no idea she was being filmed until after the encounter happened. It also seems that the perpetrator who carried out the assault and the person who filmed the assault were two different people. She evidently expressed to him that she was devastated and that she wanted to kill herself. It appears that this is the last text she sent to that friend. It was also found that she had wanted to contact the boys in possession of the video, a plan that she eventually went through with. There were texts that came from Ebby's phone that clearly showed she had contacted at least one of the boys involved in the assault, and she wanted to have the video in her possession. Given Ebby's independent and headstrong nature, which we'll get into later, it's not shocking that she would have wanted to confront whoever was involved in the assault and the filming of it. When Ebby didn't show up, answer her phone, or respond to any text messages, Michael grew anxious and went to talk to Ebby's mother and explain everything that had happened. By the time he had described the conversation to Lori and they had allowed a few more minutes to let her answer, the entire family began to try and contact her and contact friends who might know where Ebby was or where she was staying that night. The following day, Ebby answered a phone call from her older brother, Trevor. He inquired as to where she was and she replied by stating that she was in front of his house. Trevor raced outside and the phone call dropped. There is no vehicle parked in front of his house. Trevor called Ebby again, and this time she said that she was messed up and located inside of her car, but that she didn't know where her car was. She ended the phone call, and that was the last that anyone would ever hear from her again. To this day, it still isn't known what exactly happened over the course of that phone call, other than Trevor saying that Ebby sounded messed up. Some people have theorized that she may have been under the influence of a drug perhaps even unintentionally. Others have proposed theories like some sort of brain injury, but I think everybody can collectively agree that no matter what the events were, it was definitely nefarious. Michael and Lori took the text messages that Michael had from Ebby and went to the Little Rock police. This is where the nightmare truly begins, where this family would begin the journey of being dragged through hell and back again by this police department. The first lie in the endless venom that would come from these officers was that the family had to wait 12 hours in order to report Ebby is missing. Legally, this actually isn't true, but it's a very common myth spread by law enforcement. However, the family didn't know this at the time and were at a loss for what to do. They returned home and made flyers with Ebby's description and their contact information. Over the next few days, they spread these flyers across the city, trying to reach as many people as they possibly could and reported Ebby as a missing person as soon as they were allowed to. And now, to be clear, um, when I refer to the original team of investigators, um, none of those people are currently on the case anymore. They were removed, um, I think, about a year into the investigation. But um, also, any time that we mention something about the original team of investigators, It's probably referring to um, any of the following individuals who were specifically named um, by Lori on an episode of The Vanished Podcast. And that's going to be Detective Roy Williams, Sergeant J.C. White, Captain Mike Davis. There are, of course, other officers that were involved um, in the original investigation. Those are just, again, some of the ones named specifically. In the early stages of the investigation, LRPD urged Ebby's family to stay away from the media. This is incredibly bizarre behavior, given that LRPD violently pushed the narrative that Ebby was just a runaway. If they truly thought that Ebby had run and would eventually turn back up, what harm would there possibly be in her family going public with her case and telling people to keep an eye out for her? 
It was very puzzling to the family, and they soon learned that that advice was bogus, considering that LRPD had done absolutely nothing to indicate that they were taking the case seriously in the first place. The police immediately latched on to Ebby's parents as suspects and yelled at both Michael and Lori during questioning and pointed fingers at Michael even after reading all of the text messages between him and Ebby. The officers sent threatening text messages to Lori in the weeks following her daughter's disappearance, despite the fact that everyone in the family had an alibi. They at one point threatened Lori that they would stop updating her and potentially even arrest her. It seems that there were two different reasons that they threatened to arrest Lori. The first was that she didn't accept the theory that they had, which was that Ebby was simply a runaway. The second reason looks like um, when Abby went missing, the Little Rock Police Department couldn't get into her phone or any of her social media accounts. Lori felt that these social media accounts especially could hold the clue to where she was or what had happened to her. So she tracked down and hired um, this IT professional um, to basically get into these accounts in Abby's phone since the police seemed unable to do so. She offered to pay his salary, offered to pay for all of the work that he did. The police department literally didn't have to chip in a thing. But not long after this guy was hired and he started to be able to get into these social media accounts, that's when LRPD pretty much lost their minds. They accused Lori of interfering with the investigation. Um, they immediately fired this guy and prevented him from having any other sort of access to Ebby's phone um, or anything in the investigation. In an interview with Nancy Grace, Lori describes how eventually the Little Rock prosecutor sent one of his own former employees with her every time she went to the police station. The purpose of this was for that former employee to take notes of every single inappropriate thing that the officers said to Lori and so that there would be an additional witness. In that same Nancy Grace interview, Nancy asks Lori what is arguably the most vital question for this entire case. Did the LRPD interview all of the boys that Ebby had said played a part in her assault and the filming of it? Additionally, did the LRPD also search the cell phones of these boys to see if they could find the video of Ebby being harmed? Lori's reply is a stomach-churning no. The police had allegedly interviewed at least one of the boys involved, but had not searched any of their cell phones. They claimed that there wasn't any probable cause to warrant searching their phones. Lori also mentioned that one of Abby's friends had an old cell phone of Abby's in her possession. The friend had set it up so that Abby still had access to things like the camera roll and videos through Apple's iCloud program. She asked detectives if they had searched this particular cell phone either or talked to the friend just to see if anything in the cloud could potentially provide clues. Their answer was the same resounding no. Lori was so outraged by the fact that the LRPD hadn't searched any of the cell phones that potentially had footage of Ebby's assault that she demanded a meeting with practically the entire force. She stated numerous reasons why they should issue a subpoena to each boy that might have had the tape and the captain at the time repeatedly shut her down and told her they had no probable cause. The verbal abuse and lies would only continue. Before the original officers were finally taken off of the investigation, the sergeant who had been the primary one harassing Lori and her family had falsified numerous documents and had never investigated anything. This meant that no one had actually been searching for Ebby besides her family and friends. Years later, on February 12, 2018, Lori would file an official report and case against the officers involved in the initial stages of the investigation. When asked why she had waited so long to file this, she stated that the LRPD had already been neglecting the case and attacking the family as much as they could. She feared that if she spoke up too much about this in the early stages of the investigation, they would escalate their abuse. After months of silence, the Little Rock Police Department finally stated in late August of 2018 that there was, quote, insufficient evidence, unquote, to prove that the police officers had mistreated Evie's parents. Essentially, their letter said that there wasn't enough evidence to prove or disprove Lori's claims, and that they had basically investigated themselves and decided not to take action. 
every one of those officers was let off for the inhumane treatment of the Stepik family and the psychological trauma that they very likely inflicted. They also completely got away with butchering a missing persons case and actively destroying evidence. Stepping back into 2015, this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to unacceptable behavior from the Little Rock Police Department. On October 28th, a few days after Ebby was reported as missing, a security guard at Shalomont Park contacted the LRPD to report that someone had abandoned a vehicle in the parking lot. He waited for the LRPD to arrive, but they never did. When he placed another call the next day, they still didn't show. The following day, which marked a week since Ebby had vanished, the police officers finally found the time to go investigate what the security guard kept calling about. When the police arrived, they saw that it was a Volkswagen Passat, just like Ebby's car. The Passat's keys were still in the ignition, the car had run out of gas, and the battery was dead upon further inspection. Ebby's cell phone, her purse, her contact lenses, and various other personal items were left behind in the vehicle. Ebby's father was the first person the police called to come and verify that the vehicle and all the belongings did in fact belong to his daughter. Lori and Ebby's father both began to realize that something truly horrific had taken place because they both knew Ebby would never leave behind her keys, cell phone, or her beloved makeup. Additionally, all the makeup that was in the car had clearly come from a makeup bag also found in the car and was haphazardly scattered around the interior of the car, some of it broken. The average true crime consumer probably has a decent idea of where part of the story is headed and the most likely outcome. However, you would likely feel a streak of optimism that at least they have evidence of a disturbance in the car, and most likely, fingerprints. Fingerprints that could point to solving the mystery of where this 18-year-old girl had vanished to. Unfortunately, while her car was in police custody, they left the trunk of the vehicle wide open while a rainstorm passed through. The storm left water damage to the interior of the car and to most of the items found within the car. This made it pretty much impossible to utilize these items as evidence, as the water damage was too severe. After finding the vehicle, the department allegedly performed a search of Shalomont Park, even bringing in cadaver dogs. They claimed that nothing was found during the initial search. Despite the mountain of clues indicating that something terrible had befallen Ebby, the Little Rock police insisted that she was just a runaway and would eventually show back up. From the resources that I read through, um, it's also a little bit difficult to determine if this search and the cadaver dogs ever actually happened, considering that so many of the documents from the beginning were falsified and um, obviously tampered with. After about eight months of this, the officers who originally responded to the case were removed and assigned to other tasks, and new eyes were set to work the case. Ebby's family was frustrated and they were hurting, but they tried to gather together the hope that they had left and hold on to it for dear life. More than anything in the world, they just wanted Ebby to come back home. Although this wouldn't be known until after Ebby's remains were found, on November 3rd, 2015, one of Ebby's close friends and that girl's mother went to Shalomont Park. The girl's mother walked towards the storm drain that Ebby was later found in, simply because it was so close to where her car had been found. Before walking over the drain, again, no one would know that her body was down there until three years later, she caught an awful whiff of something rotting. She immediately told her daughter to stay back and called the police. When they didn't show up, she called again. She made it clear that she was not leaving the area and would not stop calling them until someone came down and investigated what she described as the smell of decomposition. Eventually, the LRPD found the time out of their oh-so-busy schedules to investigate the smell of decomposition coming from a storm drain that was practically next to where an abandoned vehicle that had been connected to a missing teenage girl that still hadn't appeared had been found. However, upon arriving and shining flashlights briefly into the drain, the police officers insinuated that the woman was overreacting and that it was simply an animal or an accumulation of trash inside of the drain. They also mentioned how cadaver dogs had been brought to the original search of Shalomont Park, and they would have picked up on the scent of a body. 
However, I think it's really important to note here, though, that, again, we don't know um, if cadaver dogs were actually used in the investigation, um, nor how many times they were utilized um, in any of the searches, because um, allegedly there was more than one. Also, within the last few years, there's been a realization that cadaver dogs are not like a stone-cold science or stone-cold evidence. They can make mistakes, and they do make mistakes sometimes. There was nothing that Ebby's friend and her mother could do. They had contacted the people that were supposed to protect them, supposed to protect Ebby, and learned that they absolutely did not care. Until the summer of 2018, this case would run cold. Ebby's family still operated the Facebook page that spread awareness about her disappearance, shared her story everywhere, and worked with anyone they could to raise awareness about her. During this time period, it was also discovered that the LRPD had delayed interviewing key people in the case. For example, the security guard who originally reported Ebby's abandoned vehicle. When the new team was going back through the original investigation and starting over, they learned that the security guard had not only never been interviewed, he also had had footage of the parking lot um, the night that Ebby disappeared. It was just standard surveillance footage um, and because the police never came to retrieve it in time, it eventually got recorded over. Perhaps the most alarming misstep of all was that the original team on Ebby's case had never registered Ebby with the National Centers for Exploited Children, despite the fact that they were supposed to have done that when she first disappeared. Now, even though um, Ebby was 18, Suzanne's law actually allows for um, 18, 19, and sometimes even 20-year-olds to be registered in this database. On June 27, 2017, Ebby's family raised the reward money for information leading to Ebby from $15,000 to $50,000, hoping that this would incentivize anyone with information to come forward. On December 8, 2017, Ebby's mother Lori and Ebby's stepfather Michael appeared on Dr. Phil to talk about Ebby's case. The entire nation was exposed to the mishandling of Ebby's case for the first time, and became just as passionate about finding this teenage girl since her disappearance should have been easily solved to begin with. And that concludes the first episode of Subterfuge in Chalamot Park, The Vanishing of Ebby Stepik. Go ahead and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to in order to catch next week's episode. From there, we'll pick up where we left off. Then we'll continue our deep dive into the rest of the case. Resources for this episode include The Vanished Podcast, THV, KATV, and Nancy Grace.